welcome all of you to this friday colloquium and uh, changing the format a bit for this friday we have with us the documentary film that we are all going to watch together the name of this documentary film is ekla chalo walk alone it reminds you about a song that was the great inspiration to gandhi's political life correct jodi tar dakshune keu na ashe tabe ekla chalo re and talking about linguistic diversity this was a song that was translated from the original bangla language uh, into several languages and also in the language that bapu spoke as his mother tongue gujarati by someone who was secretary to mohandas karamchand gandhi uh, and it was gandhi ji who was again singing this song in his mind and on his lips when india was about to gain freedom walking in on the eastern side of india through the lanes and violence this documentary film ekla chalo reveals a transition of the mahatma to bapu through fiction as well as the nostalgia of romantic archival clips that can help convey his message of tolerance peace and compassion to a new generation of indians i want to welcome documentary film maker nachiket patwadan who is with us who has made this film and he will be responding to questions and holding conversations with us after the screening of the film thanks a lot again um, welcome nachiket would you like to come to uh i stand corrected it's not documentary film uh by the genre uh it's a it's a creative effort to engage with the message of peace tolerance and what mahatma gandhi stood for and um, as those of you who have read the plot and who have read bit about the film know that there is also an engagement with the community of academic researchers and what meanings they read into the work and message of bapu so thanks for coming in and i am looking forward to the questions and answer session you can ask question in marathi english hindi maza pahila prashna asa hai ki ki gandhi ji varti maza avaz motha rahu de gandhi ji varti kaam film karavishe vati mhanje tumche kay vichar ahet ani prerna kay hoti चित्रपट करायचा प्रस्ताव आला म्हणून आणि जवळजवळ नऊ दहा महिने मे बी वन इयर त्या चित्रपटाची काय गोष्ट असू शकेल कशा पद्धतीने करायचं ह्याच्यात घालवलं आम्ही आणि सुरुवातीला डॉक्टर नायरची एक प्रिझन डायरी म्हणून त्यांनी लिहिली आहे सुशीला नायरनी डॉक्टर सुशीला नायर रोड a book called the prison diary which is the account of the 21 months they spent in the aga khan palace so that was the starting point and i found that it wouldn't make a worthwhile film to follow a diary of 21 months so we went through a lot of uh, you see gandhi's life is far too vast to be enclosed in one film so it was almost after 9 10 months of looking at different alternatives that i arrived at this imaginary situation of a puna girl coming back to complete her thesis because the original project was for mahatma gandhi and puna city but through these months of development i found that the need to project puna city as a protagonist didn't really appeal to me it didn't seem to be working out adequately and the environmental crisis was far greater so i have then it moved from gandhi and puna city to gandhi and the environmental crisis so it sort of evolved over a very long period
Does that answer your question? No, no, go ahead. Because you see, I had, of course, like many of you, known a lot about Gandhi ever since childhood. Uh, but this film enabled me to, made me read a lot more whatever I had not read. So a lot of blanks got filled in. We have seen that uh, there are different ideology of people who they who are very good artists too, and nowadays they are publicly, um, I mean, announcing their views on that, which is um, I will I mean I will not comment on that anything. But uh, is it that the or one of the reason that you have made this film? No, having started off, I I just like the idea of making a film to begin with. So we had. Uh, more or less a budget and a time frame. Mm -hmm. And looking at the prison diary and looking at Gandhi, I felt it didn't make sense to make a film which does not look at him from today's context. So one of the reasons why I arrived at this girl doing a thesis was that we will have a contemporary framework to look at him and not uh, have him as a piece of history, but as something that's living today. Because my experience with Hind Swaraj and whatever he has written has been that it's as relevant today as it was before. In fact, I find it extremely contemporary. And you have to remind yourself that this is written a hundred years ago. Yes. So that was my sense of discovery that he had written Hind Swaraj, I think, in the 1890s or something mm. on a ship from London coming back to South Africa. So. A lot of those things have already been projected by him. So I just felt that I needed to look at him from today. That was the... Okay. Hello, sir. I am Manish. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate. It was really a very wonderful movie. And uh, my question is very simple that uh, if we talk about the Gandhian idea, so what is uh, right now is going on and according to you, what should be the changes we should take uh, in ourselves? I think, uh, as I mentioned here, austerity and degrowth to me are the two key factors which are needed. I am actually, I was introduced as a filmmaker, but I am an architect by training. And I got into filmmaking uh, after I started architectural practice and uh, through art direction and then gradually it's an irresistible medium. So uh, I find that the building industry today is a major contributor to the environmental crisis. And unless we very actively use austerity and degrowth, which are not just uh, abstract terms, but one can live that. And I think the pandemic has taught all of us how uh, superfluous are attachments to clothes and houses and everything is. I mean, life is actually much, much simpler than what we have made it out to be. So mankind and all of us have made life into a very complicated, destructive process. We have sort of done away with most of the other species, for example. So I think that uh, austerity, degrowth are very doable things. I have a lot against the general trend of urbanization and concrete towers, which I think are completely wasteful. It's not necessary to live above the treetops. We can produce as much density of human habitations as we want with ground and two floors. But today the lobby that controls elevators, escalators, grains, the whole equipment and the industry that is controlling building construction, for them to step back it's going to be a very difficult uh, process. And without combined social will, without political will, these things will not happen because greed and power remain the motivating factors. That's unfortunate, but it's eventually up to all of us individually to realize this, I think. That's the starting point. Thank you, sir. Sir? So, yeah. yeah. तर सर्वप्रथम खूप मोठं थँक्यू कारण इतके दिवस झालं बेंगलोरमध्ये राहतोय आणि त्याच्यानंतर शिवाजीनगरचा भाग सिंहगडाचा भाग 
या मोठ्या पडद्यावर ते बघायला मिळालं आहे आणि तुम आत्ता ज्या मी फिल्ममध्ये बघितलं सॉरी हिंदी हिंदी स्पीकर्स बट याच्यातून एवढं कळालं की सध्याच्या घडीला न्यूट्रल राहणं हे भयंकर अवघड आहे म्हणजे एकीकडं तुम्ही महात्मा गांधींना महात्मा म्हणणं काही काही म्हणजे स्व कथित आंबेडकरवादी असं म्हटलं असं म्हणतात की आंबेडकरांनी त्यांच्या आयुष्यभर गांधींना महात्मा कधी म्हटलं नाही बॅरिस्टर गांधीच म्हणायचे आणि दुसरीकडं आत्ता सध्याच्या घडीला गोडसेंचं दैव दैवीकरण करणारी सुद्धा लोक आहेत जे गांधींचे गांधींना हेट करतात आता सध्याच्या घडीला मग आता जर गांधी असले असते तर ते याच्याकडे त्यांनी कसं बघितलं असतं म्हणून म्हणजे महात्मा म्हणणं इतकं इतका छोटा माणूस गांधी नव्हता इतकं नक्की आहे परंतु न्यूट्रल राहणं याच्यावरती गांधींचं काय भाष्य असतं तुमच्या मते जर तुमचं इतकं वाचन झालंय सगळ्यांचं नो आय फील दॅट लॉट ऑफ द टर्म्स दॅट आर यूज अँड लँग्वेज वी यूज इज इन अ सेन्स अ लिटल इरेलेव्हंट आय वुड गिव्ह इम्पॉर्टन्स टू वॉट यू कॉल गांधी आय मीन यू माईट कॉल हिम महात्मा यू मे नॉट I mean the fact that barrister uh, Ambedkar called him barrister doesn't upset me at all fine I mean I'm okay with it uh, Gandhi also is not today seen as somebody who was approving of what Ambedkar did but if you look at the details you can't help realizing that Ambedkar was the only intellectual influence on Gandhi's thinking and all his contemporaries did not match Ambedkar's intellectual understanding of issues so his entire policy on many issues was influenced by ambedkar and gandhi changed over his life he changed his ideas and opinions about things and ambedkar was a very major influence so if we look at it from a little uh, objective point of view and not worry about slogans and names i think today we have a huge amount to learn from ambedkar as well as gandhi and uh, what he would have done i can't imagine because everything is going so wrong that uh, he was very lucky to have been a part of a british empire i mean if belgians were ruling us they would have thrown him out of that train without waiting for that next station so <laughs> the british ruled in a certain way and gandhi's resistance to them was accepted and it led to what it did also because of a huge number of circumstances which today don't exist so i really hate to think what would have happened but if we understand him in our own way i think uh, all of us can be influenced and act accordingly i mean today it's no longer necessary to uh, demonstrate your political views either i think if we uh, like in so many discussions one talks about politics to me it really doesn't matter actually the local corporator is probably more important to me than who the prime minister or the chief minister is our day to day lives are related with our if if my society can't agree on something i find that uh, working and thinking <coughs> together has become extremely difficult it might be the watchman's salaries or a leave for him on a sunday that members don't agree on and they get upset about simple parking rules and which car should be where leads to major <laughs> disruptions so i think if in our own way we decide that human beings belong to the same race and should not be fighting each other but should work together i think that will take us a huge distance shilpa and then there is a uh, hello ankush and then I'll okay so uh, we are learning lot about uh, gandhi and ambedkar in the classrooms so yeah my question is very simple but not that much simple so uh, as uh, gandhi is talking about villages and uh, going back to the villages so uh, what would be the ideal village in terms of today's present world so that could include everyone for example nowadays we are uh, we, we see in the villages villages are not that much ideal what gandhi uh, thought about like there is exclusions there is hierarchies there are lots of uh, patriarchies and uh, also uh, caste system and everything is there and uh, that's why ambedkar uh, ambedkar thought about it is the uh, village is the uh, is the sign of operation so if we thought about like as a developmental practitioner we should go back to the villages so what would be uh, your ideas about village in gandhi term i would talk about going back to the village as a simple equation of density of habitations i think to begin with people shouldn't be living in houses more than two floors high 
people should not be cut off from farming and agriculture at all. Just as there has been among some of the wiser countries, there is a huge amount of urban agriculture happening. Every terrace, every balcony, every chhajja, no horizontal space in the city is spared and you grow food on it. Similarly, all the so-called urban luxuries are today available in village areas. You have internet, you have, you can, there is nothing that you can't do in a village if you compare it to the villages of the 30s and 40s. So I think today, instead of looking at urban and rural areas as a conflict of some kind, I would say it is primarily a den density equation. And we don't need to live in dense situations at all. And uh, that to me would be a village, and a lot of rural communities can function today in that manner. For instance, the two amendments that we have enacted, 73 and 74, they have actually laid out the groundwork for a huge revolution, which hasn't happened. In rural areas, there are a number of places where they have actually taken control of decision making. So a village is able to decide what they grow, what they plant, where they sell, and that process, if they avail of all the facilities, like the rural employment schemes, if they actually work, they will automatically help in bringing everybody on a common level playing ground, as with education. Now, we have, at the moment, stopped even documenting the number of dropouts. But there's a huge dropout rate of children, more in rural areas than in urban areas. So if that actually, the existing laws functioned, I think it would make a huge difference. If Mohalla committees could take decisions instead of leaving some higher authority to do it, and we have town planning happening with no town planning instinct going into it. It's the local uh, cooperator or whoever throws his weight around decides this is a one-way street or whatever. But all these actually should come at the end of technically qualified people talking about town planning bylaws, which doesn't happen. So uh, I think I don't know if that answers the question, but I think the difference between rural and urban is very easily bridgeable now. Sir, I want to ask one more question. You have said in the documentary that Gandhi Ji's recording, which is allopathic, is the same as 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 the same. But the current scenario is that we don't have trust in the natural path, we don't have so much trust in the natural path, we don't have so much trust in the natural path, we don't have so much trust in the natural path. So if we talk about the pandemic, we have lost a lot of trust in the natural path. So how can we execute this natural path? Or how can we apply these practices to apply these things? How can we connect with these things? My experience is that today, cure is better than prevention because it makes a lot of people rich. If you look at cure, right from the ambulance driver to everybody makes money through one cure or another. Prevention in the shape of eating right food and keeping fit doesn't pay anybody anything. So the whole media, the entire uh, what you call a lifestyle is taking us away from prevention and it's taking us into a situation where anything can be cured. Your knee can be replaced, your any illness can be repaired and fixed. So the mindset is that it's taking us towards cure as a permanent part of our lives. Whereas I actually feel that prevention should be a permanent part of our lives. And my personal experience has been that allopathy does get you into various side effects and other illnesses, which allopathy doesn't. And if allopathy is seen as something which begins with your grandmother's remedy, with the kitchen and with the food you eat every day, then you see it differently. It should be seen as, I remember an advertisement of one of these food uh, lifestyle things. They have a chair with all kinds of food kept on it. And at the bottom of that note, what is the most damaging is the chair we sit on. Because to sit cross-legged and to use your own physical body in the right manner is something we are doing away with as a part of lifestyle. So I think Ayurveda is available to all of us actually at home. So one needn't look at, and I'm not running down the benefits of surgery or an X-ray or an MRI, but instead of that being one of the available options for critical situations, to do that as the first step. I mean, today a doctor will not only not feel your pulse, he won't feel your stomach or your back or take a stethoscope and make you breathe and see the picture inside. He won't even see you until you have done 
the numerous tests. And unfortunately, a hospital which has spent a few crores of rupees on equipment, then their first objective is to recover that money. So it's a difficult process, but I think uh, Ayurveda is available to all of us. And it's different in different regions. If you take the trouble to find out, there are local uh, recipes in the food that grows everywhere. So just as architecture, if you restrict it to building with materials within a kilometer's radius, you can build whatever you like. But it's become fashionable to import stone from here and this from there and so buildings end up costing something, you have to recover that money and it becomes a big money uh, enterprise. So, the Bangalore to Alia Prasna Pahil and this Marathi Prashna Vichana Ji Sandhi Me Ali, then Marathi Tas Bholil Me. Please translate also, the kids can translate your question. Okay. Okay. Then, I mean, आमला तो सदस्य स्टेट डेमोक्रेसी नहीं सिविल सोसाइटी नाम जो विषय है अनेक तरह में गांधी अंबेडकर अनेक नेहरू ये ऐसी गावाजी संकल्पन का है या वर्ती बरिस चर्चा होती है क्लासरूम में देखने होती है अनेक बाहर पन जब ना चटेबल वर्ती पंता चर्चा बरस दे दस्ता तर एक असल जानवरता स्तर की बरस स्त्रियां वर्चे कई तरह विषय मतलब उस लाई चे कि वह मंग अच्छा कुटले तरी छोटे छोटे विषय निउड़ाई उस लाई चे यानी अख तमान से लड़ी स्मिस करूँ डाका ऐसा मैं जब मिथला लड़ी स्मिस कल्चर मने लग लो आजकल कि अक्षर चे तमान से लड़ तुम्ही हाँ मानुस कामातन होता कि वह तो सा हाँ विषय बगीतला � अपने लते सत्व का वाले पर नियम किधी सत्व तन ना कैसे समझूं सांगाई से त्यावेज बरस दा से हाथ बल जाले सर का बाट तो मंजे आसन नहीं कि गांधी ला पूर्ण पने स्वीकार ले पाई जब उन बरस बरस मुद्दे जावर्त मी ही क्रिटिसाइज करतो पन तेज डिसमिस कल्चर मालूम तो दोनों दर्शाऊं दान अंतर आधी का दिक जस्त मोटे प्र Obviously, at that time, the destination of the disgusted sia. And of fact, the only way that Japan has become aесс drafted by the Shibaya Gal Nacht. What do you think this would be? I don't know. And this is the point. What he wants to know is that the kind of academic subjects which review Ambedkar, Gandhi, Nehru, their concepts of village life, a part of this is finding fault with Gandhi on various counts and dismissing him generally as something that somebody that you need not take seriously. So I feel that it's a personal decision. I wouldn't dismiss anybody at all. I have read Ambedkar, Gandhi and Nehru and I feel, yeah. So I feel that there is a lot that we can learn from all three without really falling for what is happening as a popular sentiment. So I, th I think we should leave whether the Beatles are popular or which music group is popular, <laughs> leave this at that scale and focus on what my personal understanding of Gandhi is, Ambedkar is, Nehru is. And I think these are huge personalities who have done a lot more work than we can actually digest. I have very recently been reading Ambedkar's History of India and I am amazed why I didn't uh, get an opportunity to read it earlier. It's a book called Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Ancient India. And it tells me things about history. I mean, we complain that we followed European history and didn't follow Indian history. Even today, Ambedkar is not considered a historian, but I think it's worth reading what he wrote about history. So I think there is an endless treasure if we establish a personal interest and pursue that. And it's bound to have an impact on what we think of life generally once we look at these people beyond the popular labels that are given to them. I wouldn't take these labels very seriously at all. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, like, I literally want to understand that you are first an art architect and turned a director and a producer. Like, it's actually, I, I want to understand that what made you interest, like, turn into a film maker or no, something? Actually, I, uh, my wife and I, we are both trained as architects and after we moved to Pune, it was more a question of opportunities. We worked in theatre and design and for an architect to design a film, it's not very different from doing another building project. It's just that the building is not built for permanence, but you build three-fourths of a building for three weeks and then you build one-third of the building for another week and shoot a film in it. So, 
for me getting into films wasn't radically different from architecture and because opportunities came I started directing films and uh, I enjoy doing it so it, it's just a question of opportunity actually the film on Gandhi I wasn't going to be the producer at all it was to be produced by the National Memorial Society which is a society which runs the Aga Khan Palace in Pune and uh, various circumstances as the film started being made the person who would have been the producer said that I don't want to be the producer so he backed out so I was forced into becoming the producer so in similar case that if we thought an idea if you also want to bring up, bring up some uh, idea or a thought in the, into a documentary as a student or someone like us those who don't have any background of either a money background or influence background or anything so how to build up such a career or a passion in that just so, do it i think nothing will come in your way yeah just do it just follow what you want to do and things fall in place take the first step take the second step and very often where will the money come from stops us from even taking the initial steps so i think money happens if the idea is good and you'll find enough like minded people and today especially with digital technology it's no longer such a big burden i mean when we had a laboratory and film stock and all that every, today people make a film on the mobile there are uh, competitions of movies made on mobile so it's a very different world and you can i think it's far easier today to do things than it was ever before also there are outlets i mean if you made a film 25 years ago no but there was no television there was before a film they showed a little films division documentary that was it so now there are so many outlets uh hello uh yeah sir uh, first of all i want to thanks uh, and also congratulate you for Thank a very you. good film and jyoti subhash and mohan agash are the very good yeah uh, very strong characters and uh in marathi there's a phrase you know that uh, gardi kami asli tari chalte pan dardi lok asle pahije aaj gardi kami ahe पण जे आहे ते दर्दी लोक आहे पण आय वुड लाईक टू टेल यू अनफॉर्च्युनेटली दॅट द सेम सेमिनार हॉल येस्टरडे इव्हनिंग देर वॉज अ प्रोग्राम देर वॉज अ सिंगिंग अँड डान्सिंग प्रोग्राम ऑर्गनाइज बाय द स्टुडंट्स नॉट इवन अ सिंगल चेअर वर वॅकंट मेनी स्टुडंट सिट देअर इवन आय केम आफ्टर हॅव्हिंग माय डिनर आय केम देअर बट माय क्वेश्चन इज दॅट्स वाय आय स्टार्ट इज द क्वेश्चन वाय गर्दी कमी असली पण दर्दी लोक पण why do you think like a, a stellar personality like gandhi and people find him irrelevant here a very few crowd here and uh, all and also his ideas like non violation no i am not sure whether his ideas are uh, no no i am very clearly saying... understood by people and because yeah. his presence is so overriding every bank note here there everywhere i think it's quite normal that a person will not want to look at it unless something makes him do it something specific makes him look at gandhi i mean there are i i find there are too many distractions also you know you have I, 100 things to do your whatsapps are filled with messages of all kinds and you know how how do you select so there is a necessary process of discretion which we all have to develop because if you start listening to every message and every it, it's just not going to happen yeah but uh, i wanted to ask regarding the contemporary thing like the people uh, what we saw on social media the national televisions and even the youngsters like us the way they talk about him tushar rightly pointed out that how we feel yes. and how we reject him totally yeah so this is really uh, like an understandable no i what you are asking is very very relevant in the sense that we all need to find meaning in our lives you find a meaning in your life through whatever you do i mean there is no fixed route somebody might do it with music somebody might do it by studying law or somebody might do it by doing medicine but to find meaning in life in the real sense is very desperately needed and uh, nobody tells you to do that <laughs> so what you are saying is a is a genuine problem though i have observed that i have shown this film on three four occasions to school children and i find that the response is very interesting they listen they have questions to ask and i have shown this to 10th 11th standard uh, students and i was very happy to do that 
so yeah i had to thank you for making this film so that we could see gandhi in contemporary uh, uh, like today's time and i'm glad to know that you're an architect i'm also an architect okay where and, did you study from uh, oh yeah not an architecture college i went to bit mesra bila institute of technology mes okay. ranchi yeah so after working for 8 9 years in the field of architecture i decided to come to this i wanted to understand the sociology of architecture which we, which was missing in architects uh, curriculum and even practice so like looking at you a way an architect can think so sociologically which is the i think the most important responsibility of an architect after lori baker there are very few architects to be seen following these ideas where it's not only gandhi in fact just to be environment friendly we have to think like that yes. but i personally see architects have failed but i have not understood the reason you're right and and that i think one of the problems is that architecture should not have become an exclusive technology and engineering thing at all even i went to a college of architecture which was a department in the faculty of technology and engineering and uh, architects in india like musicians were trained as a part of that's what i briefly mentioned in the kathak dance class that uh, there was a certain injustice of the caste controlling architecture but we had in the pre british era that's right up to the end of the 18th century we had architects who were operating like turnkey uh, managers they would get the building completed in all aspects and in that process there was training of younger architects there was a certain amount of research and development there was marketing and all that under one roof and one of the objectives of the british empire in india was to demolish a successful building industry so a whole layer of foreign architects and supervisors was brought in and indigenous architecture was destroyed and they brought in architectural training which happened spontaneously i mean it's like uh, looking at musicians you had outstanding musicians and dancers who have developed their skills out of a family of dancers or musicians and that's what would have happened with architecture but unfortunately the bias of an engineering background was framed because the minute you start putting things into a classroom there is a problem because something which you learn through experience you are trying to replace it with a classroom and it never works and then we had in 1947 higher salaries for science than humanities so all the architecture teachers got together and said hey we are science we are not an art so they lobbied and all the architecture colleges moved out of the arts and into technology and engineering actually a student who is good at economics or music or history can make as good an architect as somebody who does physics chemistry and maths in fact the amount of physics you need for architecture can be taught in one week so to restrict architectural admissions to the science stream was itself an injustice uh, it has to be brief actually. this is last <laughs> question at 5 o'clock there is another event uh, so please keep it. Yeah, okay hi uh first of all i, I really uh, really like to appreciate one uh, one of your your replies like uh cure is uh cure does not make anyone rich and like s- s- that kind of responses because what i found no, is prevention like, doesn't make anybody rich <laughs> cure is making yeah cure is making rich. everyone rich and prevention doesn't make everyone rich. Well, that, same thing actually uh, why uh, what i realized was these kind of things happen because people there, there is some desire and uh, there is some desire to uh, follow or accept the modernity and that's a, the space which we are sitting here is also kind of a modernity yes. this theater space itself so what i want to ask is like uh, that is very difficult to change also the li- lifestyle change and consumption change and everything so do you think really uh, we need to force people like force uh, people to change the lifestyle or we need to adapt or we need to limit our usage of this kind I of thing i think it will begin with understanding so even if you go to a college where you are paying huge amount of fees if you deep down understand that real education is not what you are going to get for that you have to find your own means and your own sources and this will give you a degree or a qualification or if you are from 
a graduate from XYZ. Society looks at you differently, but never get fooled into looking at yourself differently just because of that. It's like you have pride of anything from your surname to the school you come from or the college you come from. But if in your heart you know that you are no different from anybody else and the son of the guy who was working at the petrol pump didn't have this opportunity but he might be as brilliant as you, in fact you know that he could be and it's just the luck of the accident of birth and all this that gives you that status, then your own behavior will change. But other than the visiting card that you make when you become a professional, you get fooled by it more than anybody else. So I think that's the starting point, that if you understand it, I think that's a good beginning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. No, these are all subjects you can talk on quite endlessly. <laughs>